You know, one of the most mysterious times in all of Naruto has been and still remains the Warring States period, a time when the entire world was at war yet no hidden villages existed. For all intents and purposes, the Warring States period was World War Zero. It was the era that not only seeded the formation of the villages, but it was also the era that seeded the slowly evolving hatred that would eventually lead to the first shinobi world war after a brief era of peace. But amongst all the war and fighting, we see nothing but anger, hatred, and death. The entire world is set afire with an ancient curse set down by those who came before, the Otsutsuki. So let's stop for a moment and imagine a world where Naruto was born just a little earlier. It's known that the Uzumaki are cousins of the Senju, and it's very likely that Naruto's genes trace all the way back to them. So for a moment, let's assume that Naruto is born in this era, and we'll see how it goes. Welcome to the Yamagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. The Yamagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. We just released a documentary about the life of the creator of this channel and the history of how we made it here today. It's super cool and was put together by a professional documentary filmmaker. The doc deep dives into the Amagi's journey and shows off all the awesome stuff that's needed to make it on YouTube. We'll fire a quick link to it down in the description and in a pinned comment. Here's a quick trailer to get you all riled up. Having this many employees and their families relying on me? That was a lot of pressure for a kid. I was running this multi-million dollar business while I was still in school. I was getting tens of millions of views a month. There were many times I didn't think my channel would survive. He was stealing my content. I still cannot believe where I am today. I always dreamed of being a YouTuber, but this isn't the same dream anymore. It's bigger. Alright, let's hop into the video. The wind was blowing. The smell of blood and rotten flesh permeated the air. The crows were cawing and crying out in the cloudy skies. Above even them, the vultures circled. Among the bodies were those bearing a fan on their backs. But there were a few others bearing the horizontal vajra of the senju. At this point though, did it even matter? Lives had ended. Their lives were over. They were dead. There was no bringing them back, and now, in death, the deceased senju and uchiha found themselves on the same side. The other side. That is to say, the afterlife. A world where they looked down upon their lives and realized how petty and useless those moments were. The flocks of children separated from their parents. The parents separated from their children. Surely those who had crossed over were faced with the conviction of what they had done. The eyes of those they had murdered and helped murder. In death there was brotherhood, and none in life were so enlightened to understand such. These thoughts were not the thoughts of Butsuma Senju as he walked the battlefield, taking quick survey of the dead he may have known personally. Normally, that was a lot. There were none still remaining from his childhood. Only his wife remained, and that was specifically because she tended to be pregnant much of the time. Not always, but there was a point that he realized that her place was not on the battlefield. The same wasn't true for his other friends. Every hand he shook, it was as if he could see their future. Those same hands extended in kindness towards their clan head would soon be covered in blood and flies, pale as ghosts, for that they would soon become ghosts. In honesty, the word ghost sort of fit well to every Senju and Uchiha. In a world where the average life expectancy was 30, all were nothing more than ghosts. Spectres attached to the bodies of those who had yet to die. Spectres of war. But as he looked over the bodies, preparing in his mind the words he would speak to the widows, widowers, fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters, but among the screaming in his head, he heard another sound echoing out among the mist. An animal? No, it wasn't. This was no coyote coming to devour the bodies of the dead before they could become host to disease. It was human, crying, wailing. Some mother or child has found someone dear to them, no doubt, he said, as he continued to note the losses. But the sound didn't end, and it set him on edge. He had heard crying, but something was different here. This sent shivers down his spine. He felt an urge that wasn't present. 
Not until Hashirama had been born, renewed by the somewhat recent arrival of Tobirama, he looked back across the battlefield and saw nobody standing. He stood from his kneeling position and stepped through the blood and gore in the direction of the cries. Hello, he cried out. No answer. Continual wailing. He stepped over and across bodies, intentionally planting his heel into the corpses of the Uchiha as he came closer. Among the bodies and death, a single life sprang forth. A tiny child crying out, shivering in the cold, its lips beginning to turn blue as hypothermia set in. Instinctively, Butsumo reached down to it, but the moment his hand touched the skin of the poor, swaddled bundle of misery, his mind heard a roar. His back felt the ripping of claws, and his hand burned as if it plunged itself into an open fire. In his eyes, he witnessed the spectral face of a fox, an ancient god formed from the very earth itself, a force of nature. The primal darkness of nature manifest into a hateful spirit a spirit that bound itself to this form. In a moment, that fatherly instinct was gone, replaced with the cold strategist who saw this child not a soul to be loved, but a weapon to be used against his enemies. Once again, he carefully touched this child, finding it now possible and far less painful to make contact. He lifted it up into his bosom and stood, having forgotten all about what he had originally come here for. He had been here to find those who had perished, but had found something so much more interesting. He brought it back with him to his dwelling, and that's basically the story of Naruto's infancy. A foundling abandoned in the midst of war. A living casualty. Cruel, but status quo for the world they were living in. To be parentless was nothing new. To be a child was a liability. Child, adult, male, female, such distinctions fell away. They were frivolous. Nobody had the luxury of any of them. The only distinction that mattered in this world was ally or enemy. The rest was meaningless. In this world, you lived quick and died horribly early, with only enough time to hopefully produce an heir, too, if you were lucky. This child was a miracle, not for any sentimental reasons, but due to the perfect storm it had landed in with the possession of Butsuma. So imagine the surprise Butsuma's wife when she saw that he brought home a little package and told her to nurse it along with Tobirama. It must have been quite the surprise. But in this era, a woman had her own duties as well. If she weren't on the battlefield, then she was pregnant and nursing. Does that sound bad? Well, it should. We're talking about an era of child soldiers. Time was not something people had in spades. It was a rare commodity that was spent securing one's future. Personal life? No, no such thing. You were born a senju, a warrior. You lived and died by that. You were expected to be nothing but that. Anything else was frivolous. Personality? Lay it aside. Grief? Fear? You're a machine, assembled and disassembled. Nobody has a future, only a legacy. And that legacy was the Senju clan. Be born, fight, make a baby to replace you, and then die. This was your reward for being conceived and winning that cosmic race between all the other possible yous that died the moment you hit the egg first. From the beginning, you were killing to live. You expected it to be any different? That's what it was to be a Senju in the era of the Warring States. And that was something Naruto would soon come to learn. He had just won the biggest lottery in the world and his prize would be endless suffering as a weapon. This was something Naruto was conditioned to learn as he grew beside his new elder brothers. Brothers in not genes, but in blood. Specifically the blood they shed and spilled together. Training day in, day out. By age 6, he could do 100 pull-ups, 100 sit-ups, 50 if they were inverted, 100 push-ups. Each one fit and strong enough to wage war against even their older counterparts. No longer children, but tiny adults. And as they witnessed their first battle, what was left of their young mind was either forced to mature or crack. Years passed in a flash. Suddenly, they were on the battlefield. Naruto had a blade, wore the standard armor of the Senju. He ran, through the trees and mountains, his breath moving as fast as his heart and his legs. There was an explosion as a kunai with a paper bomb hit the ground about three meters to his left. He was lucky that a rock was there, or the ringing in his ears and concussive shock to his body would be the least of his worries. He heard the distant clamor of battle cries. They were in full retreat. The Uchiha were coming. At their head was Tajima Uchiha, the oldest and most skilled Uchiha in the clan. It had been a disaster. On their way through a valley, they had been met with the Uchiha to their front, Uchiha forces flanking them on the right and left, having taken the higher ground. He saw flames before him as it appeared that the Uchiha were now sealing off their only exit, closing the box. To his right was his childhood friend, Itsuko. Suddenly, an explosive kunai landed beside him. Itsuko, with the strength of every ounce of his chakra, pushed Naruto over a rock and into a cave as it exploded. For the sake of the viewer, I won't describe this, but for Naruto's eyes, he would suddenly see the meaning of life. Not the life he was supposed to have, but the life he was forced to have. He had been born only to suffer and die an excruciatingly painful death. 
For a second, he envied Itsuko. He hit the cave floor hard, cracking his head open a little on a rock. There was some blood, but to his knowledge, there wasn't a fracture. He lifted his head up over the rock to look and see the masses of Senju that had taken to the rear running. He watched them run and suddenly started falling as kunai and crossbow bolts struck from afar. Tears were forming in his eyes as he watched. No, this isn't real. This can't be real. What nightmare have I been born into? Suddenly, a hand grabbed his mouth as an arm wrapped around his waist and pulled him deeper into the cave. Naruto pulled out his broken sword and swung like mad, his muffled screams drowned out by the fear in his head. Suddenly, he turned the blade on himself and tried to stab. He would rather die by his own hand than suffer what he had heard the Uchiha do to prisoners. What he knew the Senju did to prisoners. No, his hand was gripped. He looked over to see Hashirama. Calm, Otto. Calm. Naruto slowly stopped fighting. They're gonna be on top of us soon, Hashirama, came the voice of Itama. Hashirama stood. I know. Stay away from the entrance. He began to weave hand signs as suddenly wood sprang up from the earth and stones, shattering the rock and forcing a controlled cave in, something to conceal the surface. They were then cast into darkness. Utilizing fire release, Kawarama gave them light. Slowly the hand let go, revealing it to be Tobirama. Naruto sat there, his face lit up by only the flames. Tobirama would wipe the sweat, snot, and saliva from his hands onto his pants. Ew. Naruto's breathing was still heavy, his mind processing things. Slowly, his eyes squinted, his nose scrunching up as his teeth shone in a twisted antonym of a grin. Tears streamed down his face as he began to cry, first as a whimper, then as a full wail. Suddenly, a hand struck his face. Quiet, you stupid bastard, they'll hear us, Tobirama shouted. Hashirama held his hand out to Tobirama and knelt down beside Naruto. It's okay, let him cry. Tobirama removed his breastplate and hugged up to Naruto. This was comfort, but it had further usage as the cloth of his shirt would bury the sounds of his crying. It's okay, he said. It's okay, you're safe now. Are we? Itama asked. Are we really safe? Didn't you see the death out there? The amount of Uchiha on their way? We're going to die. Nobody's going to die, Tobirama said. Not so long as we play it safe. Tobirama looked around. We'll ride out the storm. He knelt down and put his hand to the ground. As a sensory type, Tobirama could sense those nearby. He was silently praying that no Uchiha sensory types were nearby, and if they were, hopefully the Senju's presence was being drowned out and concealed by the multitude of other Uchiha nearby. Kawarama stood there silently. We're gonna make it out of this, guys. I promise. We'll be home by the end of the day. Tonight, we'll be in our beds, and tomorrow, we'll wake up as if this was all just a bad dream. Just have faith. Tobirama stood and reached out to Kawarama's hand, sniffing the flame. Get down! They're right on top of us! The four of them hit the ground and pressed against a wall. Itama was curled up, hugged up to Kawarama, letting out a quick whelp of fear. Kawarama put his arm around his little brother and pulled them closer. As if war weren't horrible enough, it also meant a lack of supplies. That being said, the day Itama was born, the boy's mother died. She couldn't stop bleeding. They buried her. Hashirama was so young, but he remembered that day vividly. His father did not cry. Was it that he didn't care? No. This was one of the most painful deaths he had witnessed, but still he didn't cry. A mixture of pride and showing his strength to his clan, as well as desensitization. He had just seen so much death. Killing, being killed. During this era, once you had done this enough, seen it enough, lived long enough, it just clicked to you that this is what it was. You did it for your clan and your clan only. No greater honor. This was the birthplace of the Will of Fire. Nursed on the blood spilt during the warring era, the Will of Fire was sung to sleep by the lullabies of war. Pride, honor, love of your clan. That was the beginning. Having thought back to that day often, Hashirama supposed that his mother also had the will of fire. Maybe she did not die on the battlefield, but she had given rise, through pain and death, to four strong boys who would push the Senju to greater heights. Hashirama had vowed that he would not die until he had changed the world. This was his Nindo, his ninja way. He would make the most of his life to make the world a better place no matter the cost or sacrifice, and he refused to die until this was accomplished. As he held the shaking and weeping Naruto, he knew that he wasn't the only one who desired this. His four brothers shared that same dream, the same Nindo. They would change the world. Count on it. Hours had passed them by. Night had come. By the glow of the moon, under the guidance of Tobirama, they made their move. They dug themselves out of the cave with earth style and began to head towards their village, east, keeping close to the trees. Tobirama took point as he was the one with the keenest senses who knew where Uchiha shinobi and traps alike would be posted. Moving for about two miles, they'd eventually get out of the newly claimed Uchiha territory and made a break for home. Butsuma stood there by the gate as the sun began to rise. No word yet, one of his lieutenants said. Butsuma pursed his lips and let out a sigh. Something went wrong. As the sun rose over the horizon, its light cast out upon the trees as a few tiny figures began to make their way out. He looked and recognized them. My sons. Hashirama was walking. On his back was the now unconscious Naruto. 
On Hashirama's face was painted a smile, his oath of survival to his brothers having been fulfilled. On the opposite side, with just a little more issue, was Kawarama, his ever-present smile of face present and a sleeping Itama on his back. Between the two was Tobirama, his glowering expression showing his frustration as he carried not only his own gear, but the packs of Hashirama and Kawarama as well. They stepped into the settlement. Butsuma walked up to them. Is anyone injured? Hashirama looked around at his tiny group. I don't think so. Not bad, at least. Naruto seems to have a hit on his head, but the bleeding stopped hours ago. Butsuma gave a nod of approval. Wake them up. I need to debrief them. Tobirama scoffed. Good luck. We've been trying to wake them for at least half an hour. He dropped the packs. They lost their cool. I doubt they can even remember the battle clearly right now. I remember everything. I'll go for debriefing. Just let them sleep. Butsuma would then close his eyes with a slight touch of disappointment. Fair. Let's go then. He turned to walk off with Tobirama before looking back at his other sons. Hashirama, Kawarama, you both are dismissed as well. Go get some rest. Kawarama sighed. Not before a bath. I hate going to bed all sweaty and dirty. They made their way to the house. Butsuma pulled Tobirama into a private room. Did he show? Tobirama shook his head. He displayed no signs of awakening. Butsuma sighed once again in disappointment. Was the battle that big? Tobirama nodded. As far as I can tell, not a single survivor besides us. Butsuma scratched the back of his head. Was Naruto at the forefront or the rear? The center, Tobirama responded. Once the call to retreat sounded, he was in the back along with the other children as per the final order of the commander. Butsuma propped up against the wall. It looks like we'll need to find another supply route. One final thing, father, Tobirama said. Tajima Uchiha was there. He led the forces. Butsuma's interest was piqued. Tajima personally appeared to stop your forces. Tobirama nodded. It appears the Uchiha intended to crush us, and crush us they did. Butsuma stood there further. He looked down at his son out of the corner of his eye and motioned with his head, telling him he was dismissed without words. Tobirama began to leave when suddenly Butsuma came to the door and shouted out, Don't forget the gear! He pointed towards the entrance where the two packs sat. We're already in a supply crisis. We can't afford to lose any working gear. Tobirama begrudgingly returned for the packs, tossing them over his shoulder before setting out for home. Naruto's sleep was restless. The nights he spent on the battlefield, the sound of distant explosions, sleeping in shifts, all of it hit him, even while at home. His mind in the weakened and vulnerable state of near sleep would begin to relive these things, being unable to understand where it was. Safety no longer felt safe, not while he was asleep. Even sometimes when he was awake, he would immediately sit forward in terror. The Hagoromo clan's on our flank, he shouted. Tobirama, sitting by the desk, writing in a notebook as he read through various guides and manuscripts, wouldn't even raise his head to look back. I think your information's a little outdated, Naruto. Naruto sat there and looked out the window to see the bright blue sky. It was about noon. To his left was Kawarama laying up against the wall. Kawarama was by far the heart of the brothers. He was the one always telling them to keep believing and always be the first to go to provide for the others, particularly for the youngest brother Itama, who was out of all of them the weakest of constitution. They used to place bets on how long it would take Itama to piss himself during a campaign. Naruto admitted that it was a little mean to pick on him like that, but Hashirama had explained once that it served as a little levity among their little family, and helped Itama keep his mind off the coming threat of death. Speaking of Hashirama, Naruto looked to the right to see him stuffing his face with food. Hashirama paused, looking up for only a moment when Naruto made mention of the Hagoromo clan. Maybe it was a little fear, suddenly robbing his appetite. Maybe he was just curious as to what battle Naruto was dreaming about. Whatever it was, it passed and he went back to his meal. Hashirama had a way of making even pig slop look like the most delicious thing in the world. Naruto sighed and stood and came up to a window and looked out of it. As Naruto looked outside, he spoke. How long until we have to go back? We get the rest of the week off, Tobirama said. Naruto looked over. What day is it? Tuesday. We get four days to ourselves. Then we prepare for the next one. Naruto's shoulders shrugged in disappointment. I don't want to go back. I don't think anyone does, Hashirama says. Then why are we even fighting anymore? If no one wants to fight, then why are we fighting? Hashirama scoffed. Hell if I know. Seems a little pointless. I had thought for a time that it was about land, maybe power or riches, but I don't think it's any of those things. We already have so much land, our clan is the most prestigious among the others, and we're wasting more resources fighting than can be gained by winning. I think this goes deeper. I think this is merely two clans and their allies being petty. We kill them and they kill us. That's the only reason. Well, it's a crappy reason, Naruto said. Hashirama nodded. So many people are fighting and dying, and for what? Because we need revenge for killing and being killed? It's asinine. I wish we lived in a world where the Senju and Uchiha were friends, Itama said. I bet if we set aside our differences, we could be close with them. Tobirama remained silent, continuing to examine his books. 
He was always a bit of an egghead. He liked to experiment and create new jutsus. He even tended to cross certain ethical lines to create differing jutsu, touching upon forbidden knowledge that should probably never be touched. This brought no ire from their father, however, as Butsuma believed this to be the natural course of action for a war such as this, and was even proud of Tobirama for working so hard in his off time to find new ways to destroy the enemy. What are you doing? Naruto asked. I'm studying Fuin Jutsu. Naruto cocked his head a little. Why? Tobirama took a moment to respond, as if he were trying to separate the knowledge he was taking in with his conscious thought. Because the seals we have use varying effects depending on what's written. They can be used for far more than just locking things. They can encode one's will onto reality itself. That sounds like a stretch, Hashirama said. Tobirama sighed. Say whatever you will, but when I'm flying through the air at the speed of light, maybe you'll finally appreciate my genius. We'll appreciate your humility too, Hashirama tacked on at the end, capping off the conversation. They had four days off to do whatever they please, but nothing seemed to attract them or pose enjoyment. They were merely in an interlude between two different battles. They had reached the eye of the storm, calm seas and even sunlight, but it was all sullied when one looked up and saw these swirling walls of clouds spinning about them, the lightning sending a clear warning of what was to come. That's what it felt like anyway. Their dread seemed to cause time to speed up even more as days slipped into night and restless nights slipped into tiresome mornings. It was everything they could do to get Itama to eat. Appetites were just another casualty of war every time they knew a battle was coming, but the brotherly love of Kawarama and Hashirama, their smiles and gentle hugs and assurances were enough to keep them slowly intaking enough to at least survive. Most of their time off they spent outside, talking about their shared dream of peace, but as time slowly passed them by, they eventually found themselves once more in battle. As if it had been a premonition of the future, Naruto's dream came true. The Uchiha and the Hagoromo clans had flanked them on both sides, splitting the Senju forces into two separate bodies as both Uchiha and Hagoromo warriors encircled the severed half, slowly tightening the circle like a noose. Naruto just stood there. Itama would rush past him with tears in his eyes and his blade in his hand. No, no, he cried out. He looked back. Naruto, help me! Naruto rushed to his side. What is it? Itama's tears continued rolling down his cheek. G Kawarama, he's in that group. Naruto was shocked. What? Why? He was supposed to be stationed in the rear with you. Itama shook his head. I was feeling queasy and he wanted to rush forward to see if anyone had anything to settle my stomach. He's trapped. Please, we gotta save him. Itama rushed off. Naruto put his fingers to his mouth and blew as hard as he could. In a puff of smoke, Hashirama appeared. What's the emergency? Naruto looked around. Where's Tobirama? Hashirama looked. No clue. Forget him. What's wrong? Naruto began to explain. Hashirama's face was struck with horror as he ran towards the front lines, towards where Itama had gone. Naruto also rushed out in that direction. As they came closer, they saw where their forces met the Uchiha and Senju, trying to break the line, but so far having no success. Hashirama weaved his hand signs and began to form trees and vines and limbs, many of which were tearing through enemy bodies. At about that time, Tobirama appeared there in a bolt of lightning, a kunai in his teeth bearing a mark. Told you it would work. Hashirama blew him off. We've got problems. Kawarama is trapped on the front lines. Tobirama would point back. No worries, we've got reinforcements. Naruto looked back. They weren't Senju. Who were they? Hashirama looked back. Is that the Sarutobi and Shimura clans? Tobirama nodded. The pact went through. They've agreed to support us. They'll help us break through. The reinforcements bolstered the Senju forces, splitting the Uchiha and Hagoromo apart before encircling them as well, turning their own strategy against them. The worst part was the Uchiha and Hagoromo clans had no reinforcements, so it became like shooting fish in a barrel. As they rushed around, they found various bodies strewn across the ground. Kawarama! Itama shouted. Kawarama! They would see a field medic kneeling down. He raised his hand. Over here. The four brothers rushed over to see Kawarama lying there, grimacing in pain as the medic was attempting to heal his wounds. The medic looked at them with a look in his eye that told them everything that could be said in words. Itama came to Kawarama's side. Big brother. Big brother, it's me. Please, look at me. Kawarama did as was bidden. He opened his left eye and looked at Itama. Hashirama knelt down. What happened? The medic began to speak. He's been stabbed five times. The wounds are deep, passing from one side to the other, likely from a tanto. Tobirama stood over them, his hand nervously stroking the imaginary goatee that he was too young to grow. He turned away from the sight. Hashirama looked down at all the blood and then up to the medic. It, is it gonna be alright? The medic looked to Hashirama. He shook his head. I'll give you s some time alone. He pulled his hands back and stood. Itama saw this and almost freaked out. No, no, come back! He pressed his hands against Kawarama's wounds. Hurry guys, find something to press against his wounds, we've gotta stop the bleeding. Itama, Hashirama spoke. Itama hadn't heard it. He was ripping the sleeves off his shirt to press against the wound. Itama, Hashirama snapped in an attempt to bring attention to him. Stop, 
Kawarama's not gonna make. Shut up! You're not a doctor, Hashirama, Itama said as he began to press his clothes into Kawarama's wounds. Kawarama let out a gasp, the utter agony so terrible that it could not escape his throat. Hashirama snapped again. Quit it, Itama! I may not be a doctor, but that guy was, and he says it's too late. We'd do better to comfort him. Itama's face showed horror mixed with disbelief. No, he can be saved if we just... Tobirama lifted Itama by the collar. Stop it, fool! Itama's blood ran cold, but his heart slowly began to warm as he saw Tobirama's face stained with tears that he had fought so hard and failed to hide. You're hurting him, Tobirama said, barely able to speak louder than a whisper. Itama began to give in to his emotions, moving straight from disbelief into grief. Itama fell to his knees. It, it's my fault. If I had been stronger, if I hadn't puked, you wouldn't have got caught in the trap. Kawarama's breathing was labored. He opened his eyes and looked to Itama, reaching out with his bloody palm to take one of the hands Itama was using to cover his crying eyes. No, little brother. I was the one who rushed off. Itama took Kawarama's hand in both of his own. But you did it for me. How can I ever forgive myself? Itama, please don't blame yourself. I love you. That's why I went forward. Whether I knew it was dangerous or not, I would have gone anywhere to help you. You're my little brother. I would die for you. Kawarama almost seemed to pass out. He pulled his head back up. Guys, lights out is coming. Kawarama took a deep, wheezing breath and held it there for a few seconds before letting it back out. Listen, Itama, do you love me, little brother? Itama nodded. I love you, Kawarama. I love you. Kawarama would raise his hand and take off a necklace he'd been wearing and give it to Itama. Little brother, if you love me, then don't blame yourself. He put the necklace into his hand. I'll be with you forever. Itama took the necklace and began to weep. Kawarama closed his eyes and laid back on Hashirama's chest. Sorry, guys. I only had the one necklace. Just divvy my stuff up between you when you get back home. Naruto was on his knees, crying. Tobirama spoke. We aren't vultures, Kawarama. Your stuff is yours. It will always be yours. Kawarama laughed a little. Vultures. You're not vultures. If you feel that way, then take only one of my things. As a memento. To remember me. Hashirama nodded. Only one thing. One thing. Kawarama opened his eyes once more. Guys, come here. I want to see your faces. Hashirama repositioned himself to be seen. He was their rock. The one who projected strength. But right now, his heart was shattered. And despite his smile being present to tell everyone it would be okay, his eyes were telling a different story. Bitter tears dropping down his cheeks from his eyes that asked why couldn't it have been him instead. Tobirama would kneel down beside Itama, his stoic face betraying him as his eyes displayed utter agony in his spirit. Kawarama sat there and looked at them. Shame I can't see true, genuine smiles one last time. Each of you are my world. I'm glad at least that I got to die for you. I, I love, I love. Kawarama's head fell back as his soul left his body. Itama just sat there silently crying, his mind yet to have realized that his brother had actually died. Tobirama looked away, unable to bear the sight any longer, and Hashirama heaved a breath split into three, closing Kawarama's eyes. Naruto was destroyed. He stood there and turned back around and began to step back. Kawarama, 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 he said, as if calling his name might somehow wake him up. As Naruto stepped away, he saw every moment he had ever spent with Kawarama at once. Every kind thing he had ever done. His rescue of Naruto during battle against the Uchiha, which had resulted in the boy getting a scar on his cheek. And now he just imagined him all alone. When he needed Naruto most, when Naruto could finally repay him for that scar on his cheek, he wasn't there. Naruto felt like he was having a panic attack. He hit his knees, hyperventilating. He felt a different anger, a new rage. For a moment, his anger and this new anger synced up, yet Naruto could tell it wasn't his anger. And a moment later, he was no longer in control. He had suddenly been thrown into the back seat and something new had taken the wheel. Something malevolent. A burst of orangish red chakra burst out like a volcano erupting. He roared out in pure rage. He felt like a killer, like he could murder anyone right now. Murder his allies, murder his friends, murder his family, murder himself. The rage built up weighed like a ton of bricks upon his psyche, and now that rage was boiling out. His hand hit the ground as his chakra cloak began to grow, overtaking his body in a pure crimson shell before tightening into a deeper red, tails growing out behind him, his face now concealed in a blood-red visage in which only his glowing eyes and mouth could be seen. Suddenly, he began to grow in size as muscle and sinew crossed over the bones, turning him into some zombie kitsune, no skin covering it. Hashirama, Tobirama, and Itama looked on in horror as their brother appeared to become something completely inhuman. Slowly, the skin and fur began to appear as the nine tails showed up in all of its glory. Its tails began to swipe around as Senju, Sarutobi, and Shimura clan members began to scatter. Tobirama stood. He did it! He's utilizing the full power of the nine tails! Itama was confused as much as he was terrified. Hashirama, remember what father said if you ever lost control. You gotta do it now. 
Hashirama began to weave his hand signs and formed a massive wood golem that he rode upon. The nine tails turned back and attempted to swipe at him. The wood golem dodged to the side and came closer as the hand of the wood golem would reach out and grip Kurama's forehead. The beast would let out a low, muffled growl as it came to a stop. It just sat there for a moment. Hashirama jumped across to the beast and made its way to its ear. Naruto, Naruto, it's okay. I know you're sad. I know you're scared. It's okay, but please, be sad and scared as yourself. He began to slowly and gently sing the lullaby that their mother had sung for them as they all went down to sleep in their infancy. The beast hit the ground and began to evaporate. In its place remained only Naruto. Tobirama passed through the steam to see Hashirama holding him. It's okay. I'm here, Hashirama said. He looked up at Tobirama and gave a slight nod. We need to return home to father. He needs to know about this. Tobirama nodded as he looked at Itama, who was still mourning for Kawarama. That's for the best. I don't know if we can physically continue on this mission or not. And so they returned home where they would inform their father of Kawarama's sacrifice as well as Naruto's transformation. Bittersweet news indeed. Naruto's abilities could turn the tide of the war if he ever gained control of them, but that was an objective for another day. For now, they would lament. Death had once more touched their family, and as Kawarama was lowered into the ground, Naruto could only think of how pointless his death was. Pointless, meaningless, as all their lives seemed to be at this point. The wind blew over the fields and through the trees. A cold wind. It felt like a storm was blowing in from the distance, and the dark clouds in the sky above betrayed nature's intentions. Everyone stood there in front of a hole being dug into the ground as a body was lowered into it. The only ones there were Butsuma, Hashirama, Tobirama, Itama, and Naruto. They and the ones digging the grave. There just wasn't enough time for everyone to lament. There were other graves being dug, other battles being waged. This was just a personal moment with the family, where the family could only be supported by itself. But as Naruto looked down upon the grave, he wondered if their family could support itself. By this time, his eyes had dried. Yes, Yes, he was still sad, debilitatingly so, but he had no more tears left to cry. He had drained himself dry. He wasn't the only one either, but poor Itama, it seemed, would never run out of tears to cry. And that just made Naruto's heart hurt even worse. He would embrace his little brother tightly as he cried. It's not your fault. It is my fault. No, it's not your fault, he said, just trying to reassure him. Itama seemed to be taking it the hardest. He felt as if it were his fault that Kawarama had died. Kawarama was a kind boy who put his family before anything and everything. When Itama's stomach was feeling upset from his nervous nature being thrown onto the battlefield, Kawarama rushed in ahead to get him something to settle his stomach. But this was just him falling into a trap. He was caught among the number of Senju having been ambushed, and it was far too late for him by the time the others arrived. Itama had been bearing this with him ever since. Kawarama had expressed his hope that Itama not blame himself, but that's exactly what Itama was doing, and he couldn't help it. He wasn't doing this out of some disrespect for his late brother's wishes, he just couldn't stop himself. And somewhere in the afterlife, Kawarama probably understood. After all, that was the kind of person that Kawarama was. He was kind and understanding. The world truly was a lesser place without him. Naruto consoled his little brother just as Kawarama once did. Itama had always been sensitive, and it was always Kawarama who had to console him and make him feel better. After all, that was the duty of an older brother. But now that Kawarama was gone, Itama was on his own. Well, no. Naruto would be the rock instead. This moment would not split them apart. It would bring them closer together. As Naruto continued to console his little brother, he looked back at the grave and thought deeply upon how pointless it all was. How pointless Kawarama's death was. How pointless everyone's death was. How pointless this war was. What was it even about anymore besides pure and utter hatred? And worst of all, Naruto knew that Kawarama's death would be a reason used to justify this war's continuation. Naruto hated that so badly. One pointless death would lead to another, then another, until there was nothing left to kill and die for. This was how the world ended. Not with a whimper, as had become the stereotypical way of writing, as Tobirama's collection of novels and works by the greatest authors in history had spoken, but with a bang. The world would end with a bang. It would immolate itself until there was nothing left to burn. A dead world that would only know peace when one or less humans were living on the surface. How pointless. How utterly meaningless. Naruto wasn't the only one who thought this. They all thought this, save Butsuma it seemed. But the only one brave enough to say it was Hashirama, who immediately got his ear slapped back by his father for daring to impugn upon the honor of the fallen, or so he felt. Hashirama would retort that he was not impugning upon the honor of the dead, but upon the honor of the living, who had sent innocent children like Kawarama to their demise. Those were the people whose honor deserved to be dragged through the mud. As if honor were something they could actually know. You can't drag through the mud what didn't exist. 
That was Hashirama's way of thinking, but after angering his father enough to strike him at a funeral, Hashirama bit his tongue. After all, it seemed that he was the only one with enough sense to see things as they clearly were, and right now, at this moment, this conversation should be tabled. This was Kawarama's moment. This was them enshrining him in his finest hour, forever remembering the warrior he was the Senju. But Hashirama simply wanted to remember the true Kawarama, the one who didn't want to fight others but love them, a spark an ember of what humanity was supposed to be burning and ultimately fizzling out. The storms that the wind had threatened began to release their precipitation. As the rain fell, the five of them watched as the Undertakers doubled, no, tripled their speed. Once Kawarama was squared away, they began to make their way back home. Utsuma, still angered at Hashirama, shut himself away in his own room for the sake of his son. All the while, the four boys returned to their living quarters. They looked down at the side of the room where Kawarama had stored his things. Each one gulped, a feeling of shame coming over them, despite being willed to do so by their late brother. Itama sat by the window as he always did. The depression in the floor beside him left a physical mark in the world of the absence of someone precious, merely a mirror into the hearts of the four children currently looking through Kawarama's things. Remember guys, Kawarama told us we should choose one thing, Hashirama said, not particularly because he was afraid the other boys would take more. Kawarama had originally asked him to equally split his stuff between them, but more that Hashirama was afraid his brothers might chicken out and not take anything. This was to honor Kawarama's dying wish, to take a memento of his life so he could always be with them. Hashirama was the first to choose. He had to always be first because he was the oldest, the leader, the rock. He was the one who reassured his brothers that this wasn't wrong. Hashirama's item of choice was an old leather-bound journal. Inside, it possessed the secret thoughts of Kawarama, as well as some doodles and drawings he'd make whenever he felt bored. This was what he chose, as it was what possessed the most personality left behind. He never wanted to forget who Kawarama was, so he took the book. Tobirama looked through the things, and among everything, he found a pair of reading glasses. He picked them up. I remember when he wore these. Ironically, I was the one who bought them for him. He didn't use them much. Tobirama cracked a smile. I won't use them either, he said as he claimed his memento. Naruto looked over everything and didn't know what he should choose. It just didn't feel right to take anything. Hashirama looked at him. It's okay. Take something. Naruto shook his head. I don't like it. It's too final. If I don't mess with anything, it almost feels like he's coming back. But he's not, Tobirama said. The sooner you accept that, the better off you'll be. This was his wish. Choose something to be your memento. What will you choose? Naruto looked at all three of his brothers and then back down on the things he was supposed to take. He smiled as a thought came to his mind. He reached down and picked up a little stuffed bear. The bear had a little sash around its forehead possessing the Senju crest. He lifted it up. Tobirama and Hashirama were surprised. You're choosing that? Naruto smiled. Yes. He then turned and walked towards the window and knelt down beside Itama. He offered the bear to the boy who seemed a little surprised. But I already have something. Naruto nodded. Yes. But I've decided what I want to use to remember Kawarama by. I choose you. And in that moment, both physically and symbolically, Naruto sat down in Kawarama's place. The depression in the mat felt so large, despite Kawarama being Naruto's younger brother. He could never replace Kawarama, nor would he ever wish to, but in the end, he would continue what Kawarama had dedicated his life to doing, and that was to be the heart and soul of the brothers. Like Hashirama and Kawarama, Naruto would shoulder any pain for the sake of his brothers who needed him. As the day passed, Hashirama sat down by the desk and raised a pen. Tobirama walked over and looked at him. What are you doing? Hashirama looked over his shoulders. There were two pages left in this journal. I'm filling them for Kawarama. Tobirama looked over Hashirama's shoulder. Hashirama had artfully drawn an image of Kawarama smiling and laughing beside his brothers. On the second page, Hashirama had put down the date of when he was writing and just a simple sentence to commemorate this moment. We miss you, Kawarama. That's all it said. As the day went along, everyone did whatever it was they desired. There wasn't much. Tobirama tried to take his mind off things by reading, and Hashirama spent most of his time looking through the journal. He would smile as he read some jokes, some good memories, and he would frown and almost threaten to cry when he reached the section about Kawarama's own insecurities. Naruto continued to sit beside Itama the entire day as the boy laid his head on his shoulder and lazily spent his time trying to sleep away the pain. They didn't have dinner that night. They did not wish to be reminded of the empty chair that would never again be filled. That's not to say that they didn't eat. Well, I suppose you could say that. They had snacks, but it just seemed that nobody found the strength nor the desire to eat anything. Eventually, Hashirama found himself in front of his father's door. He went to knock on it when he stopped. 
He heard something. His curiosity got the better of him. He slid open the door and peeked in. The far wall had a hole about the size of Butsuma's fist in it. He then witnessed his father sitting there at the edge of his bed. He held a picture frame in his hands and lovingly stroked the image. It was of Butsuma and his wife, the mother of Hashirama, Tobirama, Kawarama, Itama, and the adoptive mother of Naruto. I don't know what I'm going to do, he said. I wish you were here. You are what the boys deserved, not me. Hashirama looked on with a tear in his eye. He gently closed the door as silently as he had opened it and he walked away. That night, the brothers all brought their sleeping mats together and pushed them as close together as possible. They four would sleep curled up with each other, hoping that this companionship would mend the hole rent open in each of their hearts. Did it? Well, the hole was still there, but there was joy to be found in the brotherly love shared between them. The day after, the cold tactician that was their father had returned, and he was ready to force his sons back into training. After all, the worst thing they could do would be to dwell on it. If they let it eat them alive, then that was exactly what it would do. And so he began to force each of them back into their regularly scheduled training regiment, all except Naruto, who he would force into special training to increase his proficiency, if one could say he even had any with the nine tails inside. Naruto trained his hardest for his family, for his father, but he was having a hard time just letting it happen, and so Butsuma would push him into positions where he had to use his powers or die, and instinctively Naruto made use of the Nine Tails. Still though, what he could do was nothing compared to what Butsuma wanted, and so he had to work from the ground up. To that end, Butsuma knew that this would be a long and arduous training for Naruto, and that there was a chance that he would never control it at all. So Butsuma came up with a new plan. He wanted Naruto to instead learn proper Genjutsu. Once Naruto showed proficiency with it, he taught him how to instead summon the Nine Tails from within him without actually becoming it. Yes, it might be a little weaker, as Naruto will have to keep enough of its chakra inside of him to keep himself alive, but regardless, they'll have the Ninetales under control, and that's a boon. After the training, however, it comes time to return to war. The look of fatigue is clear on everyone's faces. The stress and inability to rest was shaving years off their lives, and each night, they prayed that the war would eventually end. As they would get to sleep, Hashirama would softly talk to them, telling them each about their shared dreams, about how they would eventually end the war, how there would be peace, how no more Senju or Uchiha would have to die any longer, and how they could start a village of both the Senju and Uchiha, and everyone would live happily ever after. It was like a storybook ending one that none of them believed they would ever see. Even if it did happen, they didn't believe that any of them would live to see it, but it was a nice thought. This particular mission they were on was designed to be an attempt to retake land that the Uchiha had seized months earlier. It had become a staging ground for further conflicts in the area, and they knew that unless they took this place back, they would never win the war. They were on the ropes. This was a make or break moment for the Senju, a time to turn the tide of the war back, and their secret weapon was Naruto. Until this time, he had not displayed his nine tails in the battlefield for any to see, save the Senju, Shimura, and Sarutobi clans. Butsuma had recently met with the clan head, Sasuke Sarutobi. This was the plan they had devised together. They continued their march. Naruto walked up to Itama, whose face was pale as a ghost. Don't worry, I'll protect you no matter what. Itama shook his head, much to Naruto's confusion. No, you have a mission to do, big brother. If you're too busy worrying about me, you can't do it and people will die. I may be emotionally compromised, but I'm as strong as you are physically. I'll be fine. Naruto stumbled over what to say. Are, are you sure? Itama nodded. I'm certain. Naruto nodded in return and let his little brother do as he needed. He walked back to Hashirama. Itama really is growing up. Hashirama was looking down at a map as they walked. He sorta has to. He can't afford not to. He looked to Naruto. Sorry, I don't mean to water down his accomplishments. I'm just trying to think analytically right now. I have to wear my Tobirama hat since Tobirama is stuck in another unit today. Naruto looked back at Itama. I'm nervous though. Itama's gonna be on his own team today. Itama's never been on a team by himself. Do you think he'll be okay? Hashirama shrugged. I certainly hope so. It wasn't much longer after this that Itama's group peeled off and went south, the opposite direction of Tobirama's group, which went north. Hashirama and Naruto's team, along with the main forces, continued straight towards the enemy, moving east. As they walked, Hashirama spoke. I was reading Kawarama's journal. Naruto looked over to listen as the sounds of war grew louder in his ear. Hashirama looked into the trees as he spoke. Whether he wrote it himself or took it from somewhere else, I don't know. But Kawarama wrote down a poem in this journal, and I think it's fitting for the situation we're about to be put into. What is it? Naruto asked. Hashirama spoke. You are blood rushing down a mountain, spirit of hate, greed, and anger, dominator of heaven and earth. Naruto felt a chill run down his spine. Naruto, today you will become war incarnate. When you do, remember why you fight. And why do I fight? Why do any of us fight, Hashirama? Hashirama smiled. 
so nobody has to fight ever again. Naruto and Hashirama made their way toward the battle lines where their group made way, punching a hole leading between enemy lines. Hashirama put his hand on Naruto's shoulder. I'm with you all the way. Naruto bit his thumb and pressed it into the ground. Below him, the titanic form of the nine-tailed demon fox rose. Naruto quickly placed the beast under Genjutsu so as to not lose control. Maintaining his control, Naruto began to sweep the field. His eyes turned to a fox's slit as he felt its anger boiling inside. To cast the nine tails under Genjutsu was to cast it on himself. The nine tails stepped forward, crushing trees below its feet along with the bodies of its foes. With a quick charge, he let loose a tailed beast bomb towards the direction of the Uchiha main forces. The blast went up like a nuclear explosion. As the battle continued, Itama could hear the nine tails in the distance. He flinched with each roar, the sound of the explosions causing him to physically cringe in fright as the wind from the massive blast pushed against his face. His group was designed to push the Uchiha closer to the nine tails, but Itama wasn't sure he wanted to get closer to this thing. As they pushed forward, however, the Uchiha pushed back. It seemed as if their desperate attempt to escape was giving them superhuman abilities. Or perhaps there were reinforcements. Perhaps they had all focused on one side of the battlefield to maximize their chance of escape. Either way, his group was being decimated. Itama was terrified, and as the Uchiha grew closer to them, the last surviving Senju turned and grabbed Itama and lifted him into the air by his collar like a mother cat carrying its kitten, before placing him into the hollow of a fallen tree. He would then pull his blade and prepare for the Uchiha. Itama sat in the fallen tree's trunk silently as he listened to the sound of blades clanging up against each other. Suddenly, there was a disgusting squish sound. Itama covered his mouth quickly to keep from screaming as he knew his last guardian was dead. He just sat there, silently in the tree, tears dripping down his face. All he could think to himself was, why? Why did I have to be born? Why did I have to live only to suffer like this? He heard the Uchiha commander shout for them to fan out and search for survivors, and to make way for the main force's escape. As Itama sat there, he heard the sound of grass as a pair of boots began to walk near the log. He held his breath. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. He heard the sound of the shoes as they left. Ten seconds of silence passed. Itama let out a sigh of relief. Suddenly, the moss covering the entrance to the log was moved, and a set of Sharingan looked in at him. Itama threw a smoke pellet into the Uchiha's face and climbed out of the log and ran. After him, a voice shouted from behind. They gave chase. Itama ran as fast as he could. He wasn't as strong as the men chasing him by any means, but he was faster. Such was the benefit of being small. For a moment, he thought he could get away, but then the Uchiha started coming in from the sides. He was just barely able to avoid them, but then fate dealt him a cruel hand, or perhaps this was the Uchiha plot all along. He was led to a dead end, and as soon as he saw it, he knew whose dead end it was. This is my dead end, he said, his face growing paler, the feeling of panic welling up in his chest. He felt like he would surely puke. He turned around and unsheathed his sword, tears welling up in his eyes as the Uchiha surrounded him. They stepped closer. One of the Uchiha, who was pulling his blade, stopped and let it rest in its sheath. This is just a kid, he said. Another one held up his hand. No, this isn't just any kid. This is Butsuma's kid. This is the brother of that brat that dropped a demon fox on top of us. Suddenly, the sword that was resting in the sheath was pulled. Any inhibitions they previously had soared away like birds as they grew determined not only to kill him, but inflict upon him the pain of the entire Uchiha clan at once. Itama kept his blade raised, tears flowing down his cheeks. Back! Back! Don't come any closer! Please! They merely pushed his single blade aside with one of the five they were carrying. Please, he said as they came closer. He tried to back up as far as he could, back flush to the stone blocking his way. Please, I don't want to die. Please, don't kill me. My family already lost one son this week. Don't take me away too. I beg you. His cries fell on deaf ears. Instead, one of them spoke. I lost not only one of my brothers, but two of my sisters as well. And my father. Trust me, when you're gone, they'll make do. Itama began to cry. Please, I'm begging you. I'm not ready to go. I don't want- Suddenly, there was a blade in his belly. He looked down on it, the blood pouring from the wound. Two more blades passed through. Itama stood there. The blades had been removed and he fell to his knees, growing weak. Finally, one last blade passed through him, causing to fall on the wielder. Please, I'm scared. I don't want to die. I don't want to go. The man stood there for a moment, compassion on his face. He was having second thoughts now. The boy was not displaying what he expected, or perhaps he was displaying exactly that and somehow awakening the last embers of humanity within his murderers. It was too late now. It was beyond too late. There was no saving him now. The Uchiha slowly and carefully removed the blade as to cause less pain. What are you doing? One of the Uchiha called out to him. The man spoke. I think, I think I'm not mad anymore. I don't hate this boy. He's a senju, Itachi. A senju. This is what they do. They die. The Uchiha, now known as Itachi, shook his head. Maybe they shouldn't. Maybe nobody should. 
He looked at Itama who was still shaking, in shock, his mind aflame in terror. The Uchiha looked down on him as he stood. For what it's worth, I am sorry. He turned and began to walk away with the other Uchiha. Itama raised his hand. Please, don't go. I don't want to die alone. He attempted to cry out, but the words escaped his mouth as only a whisper. He was alone. There was nobody there. Just Itama. Itama, a voice said. He opened his eyes and looked up. Kawarama? The boy with the scar on his cheek smiled to Itama as he always had. Itama spoke. Kawarama, I think I'm dying. Help me. Kawarama's face showed sorrow on it as if he were fighting back tears. Itama, you already have. Itama's eyes sparked with realization as he looked to the side and saw his own body slumped against the stone. He began to cry harder. Kawarama pulled him into a hug. Don't be scared. It's beautiful over there. There's no war. Mom's there. And you won't believe how many Uchiha and Senju are there. They're all friends, too. The piece Hashirama said we would get to see, it's there. It's all there. There's no need to be afraid. There's no reason to be scared. Itama looked to him, tears still present on the lower lids of his eyes. But what about Naruto? What about Hashirama and Tobirama? What about Dad? They'll have to learn how to manage on their own. They'll be sad, yes, but in the grand scheme of things, in the eyes of eternity, their pain will only last a moment. They'll heal, and when their time comes, we'll come and get them. He took Itama's hand and both walked into the light, leaving the darkness and the terror of the world behind for the peace of love and heaven and the one who made it. The sound of crows overhead marked the resting place of Itama as the distant sound of explosions and warfare sung its lullaby for the innocent soul whose eternal sleep was now at hand. The battle had turned, and now the Uchiha were on the run. This was perplexing to Hashirama and Naruto as they were supposed to be unable to escape. Nonetheless, the Senju gave chase. Tobirama's group catching up. Tobirama ran forward and stood upon a stone and looked back at his troops and let out the most vicious battle cry a child soldier had ever made. It was enough. It coaxed from his troops a cry as powerful as his. They gave chase with everything that they were, even going so far as to rally the troops of Naruto and Hashirama. They gave chase too. Hashirama looked to Naruto. Itama's forces were supposed to stop them. I hope to God that he's okay. Naruto released the contract with Kurama and the beast disappeared. Together they joined the group chasing after the Uchiha. As they passed by the area where the southern forces were supposed to be boxing the Uchiha in, Naruto and Hashirama slowed down, letting their forces pass them by. They cried out, Itama! Itama, where are you? There was no response. It seemed as if there had been no survivors. The air was permeated with the stench of blood. The two brothers rushed through the forest, calling out for their youngest sibling. Naruto, calling upon the power of the Ninetales, found he was able to pick up a scent. It smelled like Itama. Coming to a fallen tree, Naruto sniffed around it. Itama was here. His smell is strong. He lifted his nose into the air and turned around. He ran off. That way. He pointed. They followed the smell only to find a thick grove of trees and a single stone. And sitting, slumped against that stone, was their brother. Itama! Hashirama called out. He ran to him and grabbed him. He saw the wounds left behind by the blades and felt no pulse. Itama was cold to the touch. He held Itama in his arms. Hashirama looked up at Naruto with terror. His breathing was growing faster and faster. Suddenly, the tears overwhelmed him and began to run liberally all over his face. He began to cry. He wailed out. Naruto had never seen this. He had never seen Hashirama cry. Not even when Kawarama was killed. He had held it together for the team. But the team, the family, it wasn't here. It was just him and Naruto, and it seemed that his emotions, likely from Barry and Kawarama, had built up and were finally released right here at this moment. Naruto also began to cry. I swore I would protect him. I swore I wouldn't let him die. I failed. Together, they hugged the body of Itama, as if their tears and their love would somehow revive the child. But tears don't resurrect the dead. Love between brothers only resurrects the fallen in storybooks. This was reality, and it was time they woke up to it. This was their wake-up call. They wanted to build a world of peace with Itama, but nothing ever seemed to go as planned. Was peace even possible? Was it even real? Or was pain, suffering, and futility all this reality had to offer? This, what they lived in now, was a nexus of causality. Two opposite concepts connected as one within the singularity of human enigma. Humans, for all their logic, were illogical, and their actions, words, and ways contradicted with what they were supposed to be. Humans were up and down at the same time, in and out, light and dark, love and hate. They were living in hell, right now, and the fires that seared them were of their own creation. Hashirama shook his head. I was a fool. Naruto looked at him. Why? Hashirama took a deep breath, trying to help him gain control of his faculties. I believed that peace could exist. There's no such thing as peace. I was a fool, a child believing in a fairy tale. There will never be peace with the Uchiha until one side inevitably kills the other. There will be no peace until we're all Kawarama. Naruto slapped Hashirama in the face. 
Hashirama seems surprised. Don't you say that. You're the reason I've made it this far. Faith in your dream. Faith in peace. The hope that drives me forward. I would have died a long time ago if I had just given in to the belief that there was no peace. You can't show such doubt. You're our leader and you have to be an example. An example to who? Hashirama snapped in a voice so loud that birds flew away. To... to Itama? To Kawarama? Who's left to believe in me? Tobirama? He's never believed in me. He's too smart to. And you, you've seen this with your own eyes. You've seen my doubt and fear. Who's left a fool? I've got to be strong for my family. I'm losing my family. You and Tobirama are the only thing I have left. Hashirama said as he broke down into tears once more. Naruto hugged him. You've been strong for so long, but I'm not asking you to fool me or Tobirama. I'm not asking you to lead us. I'm asking you to lead yourself. I'm not asking for you to boost my faith in your dreams. I have faith. I'm asking you to believe in your dreams. It can work. It can happen. It's foolish, Hashirama said. It's a foolish cause and it's meaningless. No cause is meaningless so long as there's one fool left to die for it. I believe in peace. I believe that we can achieve it. Don't let yourself be fooled by this world as father was. You can make peace. You may be the only one. You're the heir to the Senju. You're the only one who can lead us to peace. And if you don't believe in yourself, then believe in the people who believe in you. Believe in Kawarama. Believe in Itama. Believe in Tobirama and believe in me. We can still do it. And when we do, we won't have to witness war anymore. Children, regardless of their clan, can grow up at their own pace and play with each other in the streets like one big happy family. Focus on that and make it a reality. That is our reality. And it's time that the whole world wakes up to it. Hashirama nodded. He stood and held the body of Itama. I'm taking him home. I won't let him go unburied here. He will be by his family by Kawarama. And so, Hashirama and Naruto returned home. Tobirama had not known they had left, and only stopped his chase when the Uchiha moved into deep territory where reinforcements were scrambled to rout the Senju forces. With the help of the Sarutobi clan, they managed to retake this sliver of land and to keep their forces alive and in control. But as Tobirama returned to the base they had set up, he was informed that a letter had arrived to him from his brothers back home. He broke the seal and opened it, reading the contents. He speed read the letter, his eyes only choosing the important words to take in to grasp context. The words Itama and dead, death, dying were the only context he needed. And when he read those words, he crumpled the paper and threw it into the trash can, lit up a cigarette, and dropped the still-lit match into the can to set it ablaze. This was him letting off steam without making himself look like an emotionally uncontrolled leader. He took a breath and then looked at his lieutenant commander. Take the helm. I need to return home. Can you do that? Saratobi should be here by day's end. His lieutenant nodded. Tobirama left. Tobirama returned home and walked in. Is it true? Is Itama dead? Butsuma looked over him, a glass of high-content sake in his hand. He looked out the window. You've always been an observant boy, Tobirama. Don't ask questions you already know the answer to. Tobirama let out a sigh. Damn it. We already buried him. Tobirama looked up. What? Butsuma took a sip from his glass. We couldn't wait for you. We didn't want to pull you away. Tobirama's fists clenched. The last possible moment I could have laid eyes on my little brother and you robbed that from me? Butsuma looked to his son out of the corner of his eye. You didn't want to see what they did to him. That wasn't for you to decide, father. Yes, it was, Butsuma said as he smashed the glass on the table. You're both my son and my subordinate. If I decide you do something, you do it without questions asked. If I say you don't want to see your little brother mutilated, he fought back emotion. If I say you don't want to see it, you say, thank you for sparing me. Tobirama stood there. You send me to war. You send us to fight and die. And then you tell us we're not strong enough to say goodbye when the time comes? He was my brother, father. And if I wanted to be there to send him off, I'm gonna damn well be there. Screw your war. Screw the Uchiha. Screw Senju duty. I have a duty to my family, and it comes before this war. This war is a matter of your family. It's a matter of a thousand-year-old grudge you're too stupid to give up. Butsuma stood up. Tobirama was on his desk in a flash. Sit down, he shouted. Butsuma sat back down. Tobirama knelt down before him. I've seen friends, family, all of them fight and die for this damned cause. And you've not once told me why I have to except that it's a Senju's duty. Duty for what? What caused this war? Why are your children dying? Tell me why, father. Tell me now. Butsuma looked up at his son from his chair. I don't know. Tobirama stood and jumped down from the desk. He turned to leave. You dared slap Hashirama when he said Kawarama died for nothing. You can't even tell me what we're fighting for anymore. He died for nothing and Itama died for nothing too. One day I'll die for nothing, Naruto and Hashirama. And then you? You'll have lost your family for nothing. Remember that the next time you send me out into battle. Tobirama shut the door behind him. Butsuma sat back in his chair. He should be mad. He should be furious. He should demand his stolen honor returned in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he didn't. Butsuma just couldn't do it anymore. He wasn't even sure if he could beat Tobirama if he did challenge him. Besides, Tobirama hadn't stolen anything. Instead, he merely held up a mirror. He was right. Butsuma was letting it happen for nothing. But then again, what could he do?
Hashirama stood there, the mantle of the Senju leadership weighing heavy on his shoulders. He looked to his father's image in a picture frame and felt sorrow. The day where I'm in charge is the day where I change things, Hashirama had always said. But now that he was here, he felt unsure. Unsure of himself and his abilities. It's hard to believe he's gone, a voice said from behind. Hashirama turned back to see Naruto. A heart attack, Tobirama said. All the blades, arrows, and jutsu, and it was a heart attack of all things that took him out. Hashirama held onto the picture frame and pulled his finger gently across it. Why not a heart attack? The man sent his two youngest sons to war, only for them to be mercilessly murdered. He blamed himself to the end. Maybe a heart attack was fitting. The only way the Uchiha could ever hurt our father was by hurting those close to him. Our father was as wily as a fox, and a warrior with all the stealth and power of an alligator. Even Tajima, for all his power, could not defeat him, and went to his grave cursing the name Butsuma Senju. Tobirama stood there, his arms crossed. The three of them were no longer children, but had grown into men of strength. Perhaps they had been men a lot longer than most would have acknowledged, but in every sense, they were now men. Despite that, old habits die hard, and Tobirama still stood there stoically, his arms crossed as if he were silently judging his brothers. You seem unhappy. Is this not everything you wanted? Hashirama then put the frame down on the mantle above the fireplace. A chance to change things, yes. And I knew that someday he would pass away, but I guess you can never truly prepare for that. All the same, now that I'm here, now that I'm in charge, I, I don't know what to do. We make peace, Naruto said. Hashirama laughed. Easier said than done, little brother. I don't know where to begin. Tobirama then spoke. That Madara Uchiha that you had a previous close relationship with has become the head of the Uchiha clan. Maybe talk to him. Madara Uchiha. Now that's a name Hashirama hadn't thought about in a long time. He thought back to their time as children. It wasn't much longer after the burial of Itama that the two of them met. Hashirama had gone down to the river to sit and contemplate the meaning of life. That is to say, he was doing a lot of crying in a secret place. As he did so, he heard five splishes, each one going higher in pitch the quicker the intervals got. He looked over to see a boy with long black hair skipping stones across the surface. The boy looked at Hashirama out of the corner of his eye. He then skipped another stone across the gently flowing water of this river. Hashirama took a breath. He didn't want the boy to see him cry. No, wait. Hashirama didn't give a damn. He deserved this moment. If this boy didn't want to see him cry, he could go skip stones somewhere else. Hashirama continued to cry. Suddenly, he noticed there was a second boy there, watching him cry. Hashirama began to wonder if he should sell tickets. He looked away from them and continued to weep. Suddenly, one of the boys tapped his shoulder. Hashirama looked back to see the younger of the two standing there. What's wrong with you? Hashirama saw an inquisitive, perhaps slightly uncaring glint in the boy's eyes, as if curiosity had compelled him to stick his nose in someone else's business. But all the while, Hashirama felt a silent judging, as if somehow this boy was judging him, confused on how someone like this could be so weak. Hashirama finally came to terms that now he had nowhere to release his emotions. So, like so many other times, he bottled it all back up with a sigh. My little brother died the other day. I just needed somewhere to come to terms with that. I would still like to, if you don't mind. So what? came the voice of the eldest boy. You lost a brother. I mean, I see why you'd be upset, but that's just the hand you're dealt. Hashirama looked back. What did you say? The eldest boy had, by this time, pulled out a fishing rod and cast his baited line out into the water. I said, so what? I don't mean to sound callous or like it didn't matter, nor do I mean to act as if it shouldn't hurt. You're not wrong in what you're doing. I'm just saying, don't let it eat you up alive. It's just reality. For every winner, there's a loser. Hashirama stood up and pushed the boy into the water. The boy looked up at him with a scowl. The youngest of the two took a step back. This was Big Brother's fight now. The boy who had previously been fishing, now sitting butt down in the water, looked up at Hashirama and bore his teeth once just to knock his legs out from under him. As Hashirama fell into the water, the boy crawled on top of him and pressed his hands to his face, submerging Hashirama's whole head underwater and keeping it there. Hashirama kicked and struck out blindly. The boy took the shots but didn't stop. He was willing to take the toll just to hold him underwater a moment longer. When Hashirama's bubbling stopped and his movements became more frantic, the boy held him down for about five seconds longer before pulling him back above the water to allow Hashirama to breathe. He held his face close to his own. Listen, I'm sorry about your brother, but don't be a wuss about it. Hashirama sat there as blood dripped down from the boy's possibly broken nose onto Hashirama's face. Your brother died. Okay, sorry. Mine did too. In fact, three of them did. Very recently too. Hashirama looked up at him. I didn't ask for your opinion. If I wanted to be consumed in my sorrow, that's my choice. The boy scoffed and dropped him in the water. No, it's not. Hashirama sat up. What do you mean it's not? It's my life. I can do whatever I want with it. The black-haired boy looked back. 
If that were true, you wouldn't be fighting in a war or watching your friends and family die. Face it, freedom is an illusion. The only person truly free are the strong because nobody can make them do anything. I held you underwater. If I hadn't let you up, you would have drowned and you wouldn't have been alive to make any decisions except die. The decision I forced on you because I was stronger. Cry about your rights. Preach about your freedoms. You have nothing if you can't be anything. So that's why I'm telling you not to be eaten alive. If you cry, it shows weakness, and weakness is a loss of freedom. As you cry, you put shackles on yourself, and then someone like me is free to lead you wherever I want you to go. Hashirama stood from the water. That's a really perverted view of things. The boy laughed. Perverted view. It's reality. Just because you disagree with something or don't like it, it doesn't make it any less true. The weak serve the strong. It's not how we want it to be, but it's how it is in this world's system. Then maybe this world needs to change, Hashirama stated. The boy thought about it. Yeah, perhaps there's something more I'd like to be doing right now besides fight. But as I said, that's the world we live in. And what is someone like me going to do to change Jack's squat? Hashirama heard this and recalled thinking the same. He began to explain to the boy his dreams. The boy thought about it for a moment. So you want to make a world where there is no fighting, only peace? Hashirama nodded. The boy continued. You know that's not possible, right? Not everyone will choose peace. Some people were born in war, nursed on it, ripped from the womb among the blood and gore of battle, suckled on the blood of their enemies, sang to sleep by the lullabies of cannon fire and explosives, like my kid brother Sasuke was. Hashirama looked back at the younger boy. The elder brother spoke. He, along with his older brother, were found on the field of battle. We thought he was dead when we found his older brother just sitting there in shell shock. They were malnourished. My father took them in and made fine warriors out of them. Hashirama looked back. Peace is possible, if we work together. The elder boy laughed. Are you going to tell me that it's achieved through friendship and teamwork? Hashirama shrugged. A little. But I mean, we need to form a strong village. The Senju and Uchiha need to form a strong bond together and forget this war. The boy held up his hand. Hold up, that's a trigger word. Never mention the Senju or Uchiha. It's possible we're on opposing sides, and I would hate for us to have to end this conversation with murder. Hashirama looked around. Fair. We should still exchange names though, but not clan names. My name is Hashirama. The black-haired boy thought for a moment if there was going to be a way that this could go wrong. Content that nothing bad could happen by merely sharing his given name, he spoke. My name is Madara, and that boy over there is Sasuke. And from that day on, Madara and Hashirama would meet together. Sometimes Madara would bring Sasuke with him, and on occasion Hashirama brought Naruto. This is my kid brother Naruto, and like Sasuke there, he too was born on the battlefield. Madara nodded in greeting. Naruto would raise his hand. As Madara and Hashirama talked, Naruto would hang around with Sasuke. The two would talk, play a little, and hold various contests, such as stone skipping. So, you have a brother by blood and a brother by adoption? Sasuke nodded. Technically, I have two brothers by adoption. I used to have five adopted brothers in total, but... Naruto nodded. I used to have four. Now I only have two. Sasuke thought about it. I'm both luckier and unluckier than you. I lost more brothers, but I still have more than you. I guess that makes our luck about even. Naruto shook his head. I don't count those things. Luckier, unluckier, I don't measure pain. Everyone hurts differently. No two people share the same experiences. Everyone just has a different view on reality. Sometimes I think that's why war exists. But without such nuances, I don't think humans would ever be anything more than robots. Sasuke thought deeply on these words. So you say it's because we're human that we become inhuman monsters? Naruto looked over. Who draws the lines on what is or isn't human? Monsters? Yes. Inhuman? No. Humans are merely monsters, but we can be so much more too. Your brother's right. There are causal nexuses, like winning and losing. I believe that humans are contradictory. We defy logic. Love, hate, we experience both, sometimes at the same time. Is it that we're indecisive and don't even understand ourselves? Or is it that we're more complex and capable of breaking beyond the laws of nature? The laws of what is in our own mind? Sasuke was a little astounded by the new thoughts in his head. Wow, that was mind-blowing. You came up with that? Naruto shook his head. No, my brother, Tobirama, is an egghead. He knows all sorts of stuff, and one of the things he's been studying is human behavior. He's concluded that there is no single answer with humans, and that humans embody multiple contradictory concepts which are, as he said, somehow all true and all false at the same time. The only reason I understand what he's telling me is because Tobirama was in charge of teaching me and my brothers. He was our schoolmaster. Sasuke nodded. My father just told me to be observant and keep my eyes open, ears open, and mouth shut. He said that life teaches you everything you need to know, while your gut and common sense help you figure out the rest. Naruto nodded. That's how I try to do it. Tobirama gave up on teaching us after a while. Naruto sat there. Sasuke, I really like hanging out with you. I know we don't tell our clan names, but if I had to say one thing, if one of us were a Senju or an Uchiha, I still wouldn't want to kill you. Sasuke laughed. 
Perhaps I wouldn't either, but when it boils down to us, the strong lead and the weak follow. If I'm commanded to kill, I must obey. Let's just hope it doesn't come down to that. Over the course of many weeks, the four boys continued to meet up by this same river, and as you guessed it, their family figured this out, particularly with the help of Tobirama and Izuna. It's at this point that the boys, who managed to force a ceasefire for the time being, must face what they already expected to be true. They were both Senju and Uchiha, which made them enemies. Hashirama extends his hand in friendship, but Madara turns it down, realizing that their dreams and goals were a lie, unachievable. Naruto holds his hand out to Sasuke. It doesn't have to be this way. I still don't want to kill you. Sasuke looks down. I don't want to kill you either, but I don't have a choice. And neither do you. He smiles a bit. Our friendship was fun. Really fun. And if I could have it for one more day, I'd be so happy. But the strong lead and the weak follow. If we meet on the battlefield, I will try to kill you. And you should try to kill me too. And if you succeed, don't feel bad. It's what our duties are. Sasuke began to walk away. Naruto called out. I don't like this duty. Sasuke stopped for a moment. I don't think anyone does. He then disappears with his father. From that point forward, they never saw them again, save the occasion where they appeared in battle. Returning to the present, the new clan head, Hashirama, snapped out of a reverie that seemed to last days, but only actually lasted for a few seconds. He looked back. Madara is the new clan head now, isn't he? We have history together. Maybe now is the time for us to form a pack. I wonder if we can parlay somewhere, secretly. Tobirama thought about it. You best be careful how you do it. Hashirama smiled. Of course. I'll tell him we should meet alone. And then we come too, Tobirama tagged to the end of his sentence. Hashirama's eyes opened, but that would make me a liar. Tobirama shook his head in disbelief, and possibly in a little disappointment as he rolled his eyes towards the ceiling. Hashirama, you're the current clan head. You have a target on your back. You need to assume that when you tell him to come alone that he won't. And he needs to assume that when you tell him to come alone that he won't. Hashirama was confused. If neither of us plan to come alone, and we know that the other isn't going to come alone, then why request that we come alone? Because requesting to come alone shows that you're hoping to discuss something in privacy and safety, even if you both know it's a lie. That's just how it is. Hashirama thought about it. Where should we meet? Naruto smiled. I think I know a good place. Hashirama stood by the bank of the river. He saw the stones there that he and Madara used to pull from just to skip. Looking deeper, he saw the larger stone that they both threw into the river together. It was still sitting there, though it was smaller due to erosion. The night was cool, and the only sound were the nocturnal insect's song attempting to be louder than the water passing them by. Eventually, Madara showed up. In one hand was his gun by, in the other was his scythe. He looked down and embedded his scythe into the ground and then leaned his gun by against it. In the trees opposite, a lot of eyes loomed. Half Uchiha, half Senju, none making any movements. Strictly bodyguards. Madara looked around with a Sharingan as none of these Senju even dared attempt to hide. He sighed. I suppose privacy is hard to come by these days. Hashirama nodded. Even if we wanted to meet alone, they wouldn't let us. I guess it just goes to show that there are limits to a leader's power. Madara turned his back to the tree line just as Hashirama had. He faced the water. I was knocked off guard when I received your parlay, but I'll be honest with you, I wasn't exactly surprised by this either. Hashirama looked over. Madara, why are we fighting? Madara didn't answer. Hashirama turned to face him. Seriously, did your father ever tell you? Because mine never told me. I don't know what started this or why it's continuing. Tell me you have a reason. Madara looked over. I have my reason. Hashirama shrugged. Please share, because I can't say that I do. Madara sighed. My reason is my Uchiha clan. Even if I tried to shut the war down, they wouldn't let me. There's a blood debt owed, and neither of us can quit until that debt is paid. But Madara, the longer we fight, the more debt we build. You have to see this. Madara nodded. It's not in my hands anymore. Do you remember when I said that the strong lead and the weak follow? I recently learned something. As clan heads, we too are still weak. I'm weak because the people below me, when unified, are strong. And the same is the true of you. At any time we make ourselves an enemy to our respective clans, our clansmen will throw everybody they have at us to get us removed. This is why peace can never work. Nobody wants it. And as long as the majority want war, that's all we'll have. Hashirama rubbed his temples. So what are you saying? We just give up? Madara looked at Hashirama. I'm saying that either way will lead to our deaths and war. So while we're alive, we might as well get what's best for our clans. Naruto suddenly burst forth from the trees. At that moment, Sasuke, Itachi, and Izuna. And at that, Tobirama and the rest of the Senju followed by the entirety of Madara's entourage. Madara sighed. Naruto called out, Madara, please! You have the power to change this if you try. You have to believe in this. Believe in the future. Believe in us. Madara turned and began to walk away. When we next meet on the field of battle, we'll end it for good. And that became a promise. 
From that moment on, Madara grew serious about killing Hashirama, and the men often found themselves crossing blades. On one particular occasion, Naruto found Itachi. They stood there and spoke. I don't wish to kill you, Itachi. Itachi looked to the ground for a moment and then back up at Naruto. You should though. Naruto was confused. Itachi then spoke. I did something really bad to you, and I've not been able to sleep because of it. Naruto listened to the man's plight. Itachi showed obvious shame. I killed him. Naruto looked up at him with confusion and a caring heart. Killed who? Itachi then continued. Itama. I was the one who killed Itama. Naruto's eyes widen. What? Itachi then continued. We were fleeing from you in the Nine Tails when we rushed into the woods. There we met Senju forces and routed them, all except one boy. We chased him into the woods. I had reservations. The moment we recognized who he was though, the son of Butsuma, I hated him. I had lost so many friends and family to the Senju, and at that point I recognized him as the source of my pain. We stabbed him to death. He begged for mercy, and we showed him none. Tears began to run down Itachi's cheek. I've been unable to tell you, I was so ashamed. After meeting you and the others, my views on these things changed. It was wrong to kill him. Every night I wished I hadn't. Every night I wished I died instead. I can't live with this guilt. He was so innocent, and we ganged up on him and murdered him. Itachi fell to his knees. So please, Naruto, I can't keep going. Stab me as I stabbed Itama. End my suffering. As Itachi cried, Naruto approached him. Naruto was full of anger and rage. He kept seeing Itama in his head, seeing the blood splashed against the stone. His little brother slumped in front. He looked down upon Itachi with contempt. Itachi pulled out a tanto. Here, use this. Kill me as I killed Itama. Naruto reached down and grabbed the blade. He knelt down to Itachi's level, but suddenly the blade dropped into the grass. Itachi opened his eyes and looked up. Why? He saw Naruto was crying now too. Naruto wrapped his arms around Itachi and pulled him into a hug. I forgive you. Itachi cried all the more, unsure how Naruto could forgive him for such a heinous crime. But Naruto's compassion overflowed from his heart. Hashirama told him once that they needed to learn to swallow their pain if they were going to bring peace to the world. All the while, Sasuke watched from a distance. Naruto chose to forgive. In every moment, Sasuke's heart was slowly turning toward the Senju and its leadership. As the battles ended, Sasuke would approach Madara and his brother Izuna. I witnessed something today that puts things into perspective. Not too long ago, my brother, Itachi, told me that he was the one responsible for killing Itama, the brother of Hashirama and Naruto. It was eating him up, because as he learned how the Senju were, he realized the gravity of what he had done. Madara listened. Today, I witnessed him confess those things to Naruto. He fell to his knees and offered Naruto a blade. Naruto dropped it and hugged him. Madara thought for a moment. He forgave him. Sasuke nodded. Even after everything we've done, after everything we've all been through, the Senju are truly open to peace. We need to stop this war. Madara thought about it. I wish we could, but we can't. Nor should we, Izuna stated. Sasuke looked over. Big brother Izuna, please. We have to consider this. I know the Senju took our other brothers, but we need to forgive them as well. Izuna scoffed at this. Madara thought about it. If we're going to foster peace and change minds, then we need to bring them here to talk. Bring Naruto. Maybe the story of he and Itachi can change their minds. Izuna was startled. You can't be seriously going along with this, Madara. Madara nodded. I am. Something about them. I'm intrigued. And so the Senju were called to meet with the Uchiha. Naruto would be the star of the visit, although he had his own entourage as well as his brothers near him. Naruto would walk into the Uchiha village as his brethren followed. Hashirama and Tobirama were the only ones to follow Naruto in. It was obvious that the Uchiha were skeptical of this and they wished to kill them. However, Naruto would remove all of his weapons and drop them to the ground. Hashirama would do the same and convince Tobirama to do so as well. The three would step forward in front of everyone. Tobirama and Hashirama would step back a ways as Naruto came closer. He saw Itachi standing in front of the Uchiha. The two would embrace, which elicited no small reaction from the crowd. Naruto would look around to the others. So, uh, hello. I know you all might remember me. I'm Naruto Senju, and currently I'm the youngest of three brothers. I'm a member of the Senju clan's head. He was suddenly booed by the crowd. He cleared his throat. This war, it's bitter, and it's gone on for too long. Our reasoning for it is no longer present. Only pain remains. That's the only reason, but the pain is present on both sides. In the end, it's our own love of our family and the loss of that love that forms hatred. We're both alike in that way. I'm not very good with words, but what I want to ask you to do is forgive. The more we hate, the more we fight, which means we send our young to die and that's not fair to them. And it only causes us to hate each other more. It's a self-perpetuating cycle and it needs to stop. I know it seems like I'm one to talk, huh? A senju, marching into your village, telling you how to live. That seems to be a spit right in your face, huh? 
but I don't mean for it to be. I do know what you're feeling, but I'm tired of fighting. You see, I had two little brothers. The first's name was Kawarama, and he was the heart and soul of my family. He would give you his coat in the bitterest of winter storms if you shivered even once. He was the one to comfort Itama every time he was nervous. And even as he died, he continued to comfort us. Naruto took a breath and swallowed his feelings. Itama was our youngest brother. The last child our mother produced before complications took her life. Itama was, for lack of a better word, a scaredy cat, a crybaby. And we loved him every moment. Kawarama was his safe place. He was always on Kawarama's arm somewhere. And when Kawarama died, it destroyed him. He believed it to be his own fault. As Naruto spoke, Itachi was breaking down into tears. Naruto saw this and put a hand on Itachi's shoulder. Itama was without his comfort. I swore to him to be the comfort he needed. I would be with him and protect him. Then, one day, the only day I wasn't with him, he was killed. He died alone, terrified, in pain and suffering. And it was at the hands of Itachi Uchiha. Naruto looked up at Itachi, who was crying heavily. Naruto hugged him. I'm tired of being upset. I'm tired of being mad. I loved Kawarama. I loved Itama. And I'm tired of hating the Uchiha. Izuna then walked forward. Nice story, but you forgot something. Some of us aren't easy to forgive. A few of us love our lost ones more than you love your Kawarama and Itama, it seems. Naruto grew angry from that. He held on, though. Izuna stepped closer. I had brothers, too. They were my best friends, and each one of them was killed by your clan. Your brothers there killed them. You lost two siblings, I lost three. You want peace, then pay the penalty. You still owe me one more Senju life as payment. Izuna held out his tanto. He smiled. Now why don't you go back to your village? Naruto looked up at him. He then looked out at the others. He pulled his armor off and stepped up to Izuna. If you need to kill one more brother to foster peace, then do it. I'll die for the Senju. And I'll die for the Uchiha, too. Tobirama wanted to step in, but Naruto held out his hand to stop him. No, this is my decision, Tobirama. I want you to promise me that when I do this, you won't seek vengeance. The age of vengeance is over. It dies with me. Madara watched this and sighed. Sasuke was in the crowd watching too. He couldn't let this happen. He rushed forward through the crowd to stop it. He cried out, Izuna, wait! Naruto looked up. Bury all of your hatred with me, Izuna. Izuna then plunged the blade into Naruto's chest, drawing blood. The crowd watched. Naruto seemed to collapse on Izuna's shoulder. The people saw this and were astounded. It was unbelievable. Naruto looked out over them, and with whatever voice he had left, he spoke. We send you. Don't want to rule you. We want to stand equal. One clan, one village. Izuna pulled the blade from his chest, and Naruto fell back. Hashirama and Tobirama rushed to him and held him. Tobirama, in his rage, cursed Naruto for throwing his life away for nothing. Naruto smiled. It wasn't for nothing. Look. They all looked out and saw the expressions of the Uchiha. It seemed that this death was not the taste they had hoped for. The path to peace. It's open. Please, don't waste this. Befriend the Uchiha. Teach them to love like we do, Hashirama. And teach them to forget how to hate. Madara looked away from the sight. He had been friends with Naruto before this, and now, despite having tried to kill him on the battlefield, he couldn't watch him die. Izuna looked down on them. You want to kill me now, right? Go ahead and try, you senju dogs. Tobirama stood and prepared to attack when Naruto grabbed his ankle. No, don't, please. It'll be wasted if you do. We're done with vengeance. Tobirama took a breath and knelt down to Naruto. Naruto smiled. Swallow your pain, labor to forgive, peace take sacrifice. And with that, his eyes closed and he let out his last breath. Hashirama was already in tears. It was then that Sasuke pushed through. He came to Naruto's side. No, Naruto! He looked at him. He felt his pulse and felt nothing. Tears were streaming from his eyes. He then weaved a hand sign. Izuna looked over. What are you doing? He killed our brothers. I require vengeance. Sasuke looked up. And you've had it. I will purchase his life back again. Suddenly, one of Sasuke's eyes turned a pale white. And Naruto's eyes opened as he took a deep breath. The crowd was in awe and Uchiha willingly sacrificed one of their Sharingan to bring a Senju back to life, and it was one of the brothers of Madara Uchiha. This began to lead down a new road as skirmishes came to a sudden halt. This one action caused the entire war to halt as both sides reconsidered their relationship. Eventually, Madara declared that come hell or high water, he would not order another Uchiha to fight and die in a war against the Senju, and Hashirama did the same. 
After so many years weary of battle, the people seemed to show some relief. However, it wasn't as easy for the people to forgive each other, and that could be expected. But just as hoped, the two clans ceased hostilities and began to draw closer together. And as time passed, the dreams shared between Madara, Sasuke, Hashirama, and Naruto became a reality. The start of the Hidden Leaf Village. The group would then debate who would become Hokage, the leader of the village. Tobirama pushed for it to be a vote, but due to Naruto telling Hashirama what needed to happen, Hashirama would pull himself out of the race, leaving Madara unopposed. Madara Uchiha became the first Hokage with Hashirama and Naruto as his aides. Together, they vowed peace. And as Naruto, Tobirama, and Hashirama sat atop the rock cliff overlooking the village, Naruto spoke. You know, we only got this far because of the sacrifices we made. Tobirama nodded. So many lives lost. Hashirama looked over. Itama and Kawarama too. Naruto thought about it. Had Kawarama not died, Itama might still be alive. But because Itama died, Itachi turned from vengeance and hatred. Hashirama looked over to Naruto. And because you chose not to indulge in hatred, we have peace now. If anyone should be Hokage after Madara, it should be you, Naruto. Naruto smiled. Maybe. I don't really care though. I just want this peace to last. And of course, it didn't. Nothing ever lasts. The First Shinobi World War eventually breaks out, and it's during this time that both Naruto and Hashirama Senju die. And as time passes, Madara would pass the title of Second Hokage to Tobirama, who, during that same World War, would also die. The title would then be passed on to Sasuke Uchiha. Peace is eventually restored, and it's during this time of war and peace that Sasuke understands what Naruto had once said to him. Humans were contradictory, and tended to not be one thing or the other. They were in war and at peace as well switching quickly between love and hate like indecisive children. But it was Sasuke's belief that if they continued to show the same love as Naruto and Hashirama, that perhaps the world would eventually know a lasting peace. And that's the end of our video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked this video, please let me know by clicking the like button and dropping us a comment about it. This video series was one so emotionally charged, but I couldn't just let it end on a sour note. I had originally planned for the village to fall and Itachi to be killed by Naruto for killing Itama, but I didn't because I thought it to be more in Naruto's character for him to forgive him. But hey, maybe there's an entirely different video possible about if Naruto didn't forgive Itachi. If that's something you would like to see, then let us know and share this video to as many friends as you can. Until next time, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.